In this lecture, I'd like to talk about creating goals for design, which is going to be a step before actually creating the design itself, and a step after doing a lot of your need-finding observations that we've talked about so far. What we're going to look at in this lecture is the interplay between the task that somebody has and the environment or the design that we offer. Herb Simon tells the story of uh, watching an ant cross the sand in the desert. And the ant's behavior uh, has a whole lot of weaves and its navigation is quite complex. And Herb noticed that a lot of the complexity that was apparent there came from the environment, from the uh, structure of the desert sand, and that if he changed the environment, he could change the ant's behavior. And this is an example of how design is a way of transforming people's existing situations into hopefully ones that people find preferable. And the other thing this tells me is that all design is redesigned, that people already have a particular design that they're using now, even if it's cobbled together or not intended for exactly the thing that they're doing. And what we're doing is we're transforming their existing situation into a preferred situation. And I emphasize that all design is redesigned because, especially in the world of technology, it's easy to believe that we're creating new things out of whole cloth that are unlike anything anybody's ever seen before. But that's just not the case. People already have ways of communicating, of talking, of sharing, of creating. Technology creates new and different ones, but they always have some connection to what people are doing already. And what you want to do in your need finding is to find those things that are the closest existing analog to understand what people's goals and values are. And so from your need finding, from the techniques that we've talked about in the past couple of videos, you have a sense of what people do and what their high level values, goals are, and what the context that they're doing those things in are. And one thing that's been great about teaching this class is looking at all of your design work. And I see how across the world, the design contexts and values and goals vary dramatically. And, and I think that's really important and it's really exciting for me to see that as a teacher. And so because of that, what we want to be able to do is take the observations that we have so far and connect those to actual designs. Now we're not going to get to the actual designing part today. That's going to come in the next set of lectures. What we're going to look at today is this intermediate representation of the goals. And one way to think about that is, what's our lever as a designer? How are we going to be able to do this transformation? And what's key to being able to do this is to figure out what matters in a design. Uh, often we think about designing as just laying things out on a page. And that's an important piece, and that's a piece that we're going to come to. But the layout, the interface, is trying to achieve some larger task or help people with some activity. And if you understand what matters, that also gives you a way of understanding whether different designs are meaningfully different or how they're meaningfully different or what it means for a design to be different. And understanding what differences make a difference will come up in terms of deciding which design to follow or which features you should prioritize and which ones you can cut out, how you should spend your time and what things you can just let fall however they may. And you're doing this already. I think nearly everybody who's designing, there's some kind of implicit understanding of people's activities. And what I found in teaching design is that if we leave it implicit, it's easy to leap to a particular solution and not understand what the space of possibilities is. And this has several problems. One is your particular solution, the first thing you think of, may be suboptimal. Also, if different people have different ideas, uh, you can get in silly arguments like, let's do my idea, no, let's do my idea, no, let's do my idea. And that doesn't accomplish anything. And so what we're trying to do is, by having this intermediate representation, by making the goals explicit, uh, we're going to give you a way of talking about the differences between designs. So this conceptual representation that we're going to get out of activity analysis increases your mindfulness as a designer. It's going to connect you to the texture of the domain, and it's going to help you communicate and discuss with other stakeholders. It also makes it easier for you to be creative because 
by understanding these intermediate representations, it, it makes it easier to take a couple of small leaps rather than one big one. And what I want to emphasize again is that these intermediate representations are not tied to any particular design. So if it's not a design that we're going to create through activity analysis, what are we going to create? Activity analysis is going to give you a couple of different things. You're going to write out for the activity that your design supports, what are the steps? for uh, What are the artifacts that people are using currently or might use in your design? And what are the goals? What are the people who are using your system trying to accomplish? And how will you measure success? If you watch somebody use your system, how would you know whether to say, oh, this is great, things are going really well, or, oh man, this is, this is really bad, this is not what we want at all. Another important thing to do for activity analysis is to see what are the pain points that people experience already. Whenever you see workarounds or breakdowns, those are great opportunities for you to intervene in a way that people will enthusiastically adopt. And you can have a lot of fun with this. Uh, one thing that you can do is get all of these ideas and stick them on a big wall and share them with a lot of people because what you're doing is you're trying to get the entire design team, in fact, all of the stakeholders, clients, even users, on the same page in terms of what the goals of the interface are going to be, what the problems are now, what are the steps that people are currently performing. So let's make this concrete. Let's take the example of starting an automobile. What are the steps? First, uh, the driver might unlock the driver's door, then take a seat behind the wheel, insert the key into the ignition switch, turn the key fully clockwise, and when the engine starts, release the key. Uh, this is not a particularly complex task. It's one that people do often, and in fact, even this simple task offers a great opportunity for redesign. So what are the artifacts? Well, you've got the key, you've got the car, and you might break that down further into the door lock, maybe even the handle, the ignition switch, possibly the steering wheel, uh, the gear shift potentially. These are all artifacts that are involved. And what are the goals of this task? Well. In a literal sense, the goal is to turn on the car. But what you take the goal to be is tremendously important to your point of view as a designer. And it's totally reasonable to take the narrow goal and say, uh, can we turn on the car better? Or you could take a much broader goal and say, well, the person's really trying to pick up bread, or even more uh, broadly, make a meal, or even more broadly, have a satisfying evening of which the meal and the bread our parts and the car is just a way to get to that goal. And so here are our pain points. In the narrow version, we can look at, can we make the turning the car on experience better? Well, is it necessary to put the key in? It's already in the car, why not just drive off? Or if the driver walks up to the door and the key is nearby, isn't that sufficient? And in fact, these are designs that you're seeing uh, today. They, these are examples of taking small pain points and smoothing them to create a, a more compelling user experience. Now in the broader framing, you could think of, well, maybe we can have the bakery deliver the bread by bicycle so I don't even need to get in the car. Or maybe we can think of other ways to provide a satisfying evening. This is your point of view as a designer. There are many different reasons to do this kind of activity analysis. And one of them is that interfaces are far more likely to be adopted the more that they reflect existing workflows that are familiar or comfortable. If you come up with a completely different way of doing something, unless it's a lot better, it's going to be a hard sell. Additionally, because you're creating new things, you'll necessarily need to create metaphors to things that people understand already. And the more grounded those metaphors are in everyday tasks, the more that you can support users' ability to learn new kinds of activities. You want to be able to, whether your design is a radical change or a modest one, have it be compatible with the environment that it's going to go into. We talked already about familiarity of metaphors. And finally, it helps you have a consistency of presentation so that similar things function in a similar way and integrate with other applications and other software 
uh, that people are already used to, and that helps convey interfaces that feel reliable and are easy to learn. And maybe most importantly, one of the things that you'll get out of activity analysis is coming up with a design for something that people actually want to do. I think that I often see, as a designer, as an advisor, as a teacher, uh, sometimes we come up with technologies that are cool, but don't actually accomplish anything. And if you look at designs that have failed and companies that have failed, an extremely common reason, which is amazing because it's so simple to point out in some ways, is that it doesn't actually accomplish something that people need done. Uh, it's nifty, but not important. Now, this doesn't mean that our activities are, are baked and firm and solid. Uh, life for all of us is different now than it was a decade ago. For many of us, mobile phones have changed how we structure our day, how we communicate with others. So activities change, culture changes, people change. But what we want to do is find a way of uh, building technology that's going to help create a, a consistent evolution because those are the things that people most naturally start to adopt and use. This process of coming up with steps and artifacts and goals and pain points is easier for some things than others. I think for many of you, the kinds of designs that you're thinking about, this will be extremely natural. And for others, it'll, it'll require a little bit more creativity and stretch a little bit. So the things it's most natural for are things like business workflows, like doing your taxes or travel planning. Those are both cases where if you watch the steps that people go through, you can see that there's lots and lots of pain points. And if you watch somebody do their taxes or plan a trip somewhere, you'd come up with lots of great design ideas. It also works really well for repeated activities, like for example, scheduling a meeting. Why does that take 17 emails now? Well, that question has led several people to better potential designs. The challenge, of course, is that although the technologies and designs that we use are, are part of the activities that we engage in, we're not actually, as designers, literally designing tasks or designing activities. Activities and objects don't map one-to-one. -one. A smartphone is not just one activity. We're designing the artifacts, and any particular object is going to be composed of lots and lots and lots of different activities. And when you're starting a designer, I think it's helpful to focus on just a couple, to focus on something that is narrower rather than broader. But even relatively simple designs often comprise lots of activities. For example, think about a forum website. Uh, here you can see a screenshot for a swimming group's web forum. And you can see how the forum is accomplishing lots of diverse things, from alerting people to future events, to reporting on recent actions, to random chatter. Uh, there are posts in here about a, the, I have a free couch or friends are coming to town, all sorts of different stuff. And so this particular technology of a web forum, even an individual web forum, supports lots of activities. And so if you were to think about how do you make a forum better, one opportunity would be to look at the different kinds of activities that are involved. And your point of view as a designer might be, well, we should separate these out and give them more structure in some way. Or if we're going to make a single forum, it needs to support all of these diverse kinds of activities. And so when you do your activity analysis, you want to support this diversity. You can watch the same person use the same design to do different, uh, slightly or broadly different things. Watch different people do the same thing. Are there differences in the way that people do their taxes or schedule travel or talk on forums? And you can use those diversity both to come up with lead user insights. Aha, this person has a clever idea about planning travel. Let's try and bake that into software. Uh, and also to understand what kind of flexibility you'll need to support. And what this does is by consistently grounding people's different activities and paying attention to those in your design, it keeps you human as a designer and it can, keeps your design work connected to what people actually need to do and, and care about. And that helps your work be transformational. So, to recap what we've learned so far, the key products of activity analysis are what are the steps, 
what are the artifacts, what are the goals, and what are the pain points of opportunity or opportunities. And like all of the techniques in this class, you don't, I don't want to be doctrinaire about it. You can and should adapt this to what works for you to fit your situations and your goals and your activities and your stakeholders. You can make this more or less formal. You can focus on diagrams or text or pictures or video. All of these are great way to, to remind yourself of what users are doing and to communicate that to other stakeholders. Like we talked about before, your point of view can be narrow or it can be extremely broad and you'll probably pick different things at different times. And you can have fun with this. So if what you're excited about is the elements in an activity that bring people joy, that's what you can focus on and you can think about amplifying joy rather than reducing pain. So your point of view and your way of engaging as a designer will give you lots of flexibility here. And so what I really want to emphasize is that this is a really great way to be creative and, and have a lot of fun.